Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Crosswalk Church. I'm Pastor Armand Agnew. We want to welcome all those that are watching live today, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch. You may be watching later on the week, maybe one of our uh, social media platforms. Welcome this morning. We're so excited to have you here. We're excited about the church today. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? We have a very special guest in the house, a va missionary evangelist. I guess that's what you are. Linda Patton is here today. Uh, by the way, if you're looking for someone to come in and fire your church up, you need to contact Linda. Do you have a website? Yes. And it is? Okay, I'm going to have to post that one later. It's very long. <laughs> but you can contact uh, Linda through us. You can get her through Bill and Sandra. Uh, she's I'm in the of updating. updating. Okay. I didn't have that to put up on the screen. I thought it was going to be something easy like www.lindapatton. But no, she had to make it hard. It's so good to have you today. Thank you. You're a blessing to be here and, and you have filled in and will be filling in. I'm hoping to get you back in this pulpit again sometime. Uh, so if you would like someone to come in and really share what God is doing around the globe, she is in contact with all those things. It's so good. Well, today we're going to continue our sermon series on the enigma uh, of the Bible, of what either Jesus said, maybe it was written in, in a word somewhere, but we're going to look at another one today, and this one just, I had to do it. This is a picture, I'm going to move myself out the way. Uh, this is a picture that we just got back from the Grand Canyon. We took this picture, it's 4.30 in the morning. I'm good, Sarah, you're good. And uh, this is a sunrise that we took. Look how red that red is. It, is a, it was absolutely beautiful. <clears throat> now, everybody knew that when I was going to do photography for Ar Armand Agnew Ministries. They knew I had a purpose for doing this. So I got everybody up at 3 o'clock to get to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. My wife posted all this to take this picture and some others. They're uh, absolutely amazing, phenomenal pictures. We're going to be using those in different ways, <clears throat> social media and uh, probably some publication of some kind. Today we're going to be look at we're going to be looking at this picture, the red sky warning, and I'm going to get into some weather idioms in just a moment. But let me give you the verse. This is actually found in the Bible, and I'm going to give you the verse today. It is found in Matthew 16. If you want to turn your Bible there, Matthew 16 1 through 4, it says this: The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting. I'm going to, have to read it off my page. And uh, came tempting, desired him that he should show them a sign from heaven. In other words, they came and he said, we want you to do a miracle. Show us something, what you got. We need to see something there. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky but can you not discern the signs of the times? Everybody say signs of the time. Signs of the time. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto thee, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. This is an amazing part of, of a verse today. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to break it down a little bit. The sign of Jonas, signs of the times. It all, it's all going to fit, but... We're going to talk for a moment today about discerning the sky. And here's some, some weather idioms. Uh, wind from the east, fish bite the least. Wind from the west, fish bite the best. How many of y'all have ever heard that? It absolutely is true. Miss Violet shaking her head. Country girl, I said this is going to be for the country people, the farmers or the fishermen. It's true. I don't know why, but back where I live in Louisiana, when the wind is out of a certain way, the fish are biting. When the wind's blowing another way, they're not. So does the weather affect things? Yeah, some people are shaking their head. And here's, here's some other things about weather. Saving for a rainy day. Now, what does that mean? Anybody want to take a shot at it? Saving for a rainy day. Yeah, yeah a rainy day being something negative, putting something aside for a bad time whether it's a, you know, whatever. How about this one? The calm before the storm. Now, we are in Florida, and right now, this is so appropriate, <clears throat> I 
Her, well, tropical storm, soon to be Hurricane Debbie, is about to hit us sometime tonight, tomorrow, all day tomorrow. And right now it's the calm before the storm. So right now is the time to go and you take all your furniture off the back deck and pick up all the things that can become projectiles. And you run to the store and you buy the one bottle of water that's left of the thousands of bottles that were there. There's no more water. There's no more bread. There's no more eggs. It's like it's the way it is. So it's the calm before the storm. Now, here's one. Red sky in the morning, sailors take a warning. Red sky at night, sailors delight. How many of y'all have heard that one? And it basically it means if you wake up early enough, which most people don't, and the sky is all red, it's a warning. It's going to rain that day. And guess what? Every morning that we got up and we shot sunrises, there was a red sky. And lo and behold, it rained every day. Messed up my evening schedule. I had all these things planned in the morning. We were going to shoot sunrises. We were going to take a hike, go back and rest because we were up at three o'clock. Go back in the afternoon and do an afternoon hike. And I've always wanted and I still have yet to be at a place where there's zero light pollution. Night sky, where you go out and you sit on the ground and after 15 minutes, you can see the Milky Way like it was sitting in your living room. There's no light pollution and you really feel close to God because the stars are brighter. I, I've been wanting that so bad for so long. And guess what? I didn't get it. I did not get it. And I was talking to my senior pastor yesterday, Pastor Mark. I said, I'm ready for this stuff in Israel in because I want to take another trip there. I want to go out and do the star thing that my daughter did. My daughter spent a semester in, in uh, Israel uh, at the school in Haifa. And uh, she got to go out into the Negev and they sat out there and she said, Dad, there was no light. It was so amazing. It was so it was like you could reach out and touch God. I'm looking for that. Y'all pray that it happens. So we just need to pray for the peace of Israel anyway. Amen. It's so crazy. I won't get into that, but we uh, we are supporting Israel. We have uh, a lot of friends over there that are dealing with all this crazy stuff. So how many of y'all know God's on the throne? How many of y'all know Israel is going to be okay? They are going to win no matter what everybody says. They're going to win. And I'm a firm believer in that. But I don't, I don't want to get on a sidetrack today. But Jesus makes an enigmatic statement about sky and discerning the times. In fact, I read it to you. He read the thing that we even today use. Red sky in the morning. Sailor take a warning. We, we, we just read that. He talked about that. He said in the red sky in the morning, it means there's imminent rain. And here's what's going on. Let me give you uh, the gist of what's happening. So the religious leaders come to him. And there's two sects. There's actually more. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to him and they're challenging him. We want to see a miracle. Now, here's what you need to understand about this. And this is a key. The Pharisees and the Sadducees often fought each other. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection. They believed in angels. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection, and they didn't believe in angels. But Jesus is a common enemy. And what's that saying about the enemy? You know, you become... Okay, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Whatever, I'm, I'm getting some side talk here. I don't remember all these things. So they're, they're, they've approached Jesus. How many of you know Jesus was loving this? And so they come to him, and they what? Show us a miracle. You think you say you're the Messiah? You say you're the Son of God? Now, these are people that have given their lives to study in Scripture. These are the people responsible for knowing the Torah, our Old Testament. They're the ones that, that know every, you know, dot and cross T about the Word of God. And Jesus is claiming that he's fulfilling those promises that they knew about. And they kept pushing him and pushing him. We'll do a miracle. If you do a miracle, will you give us some proof that you are who you say you are? And listen, they were denying that he was the Messiah, even after everything that he was doing, these miracles and all these works. And he was all his conduct and his humility and his teachings and his preaching, everything about him pointed to the Messiah. Every verse. <clears throat> 
in the Old Testament was pointing to him. By the way, we're doing a, a new series on the shadow of Christ. We're showing Christ in every book of the Bible because the Bible is about redemption. It's about the fall of man and God redeeming mankind through Jesus Christ. The whole Bible is what it's about. It's, that's what it's there. Come on, somebody give me an amen. It's very, very good. So they were tempting. They were demanding a sign. We want some proof. Do some kind of magic. Well, Herod himself even wanted this. And you can see this in Luke 23, 8. And when Herod saw Jesus, remember Herod and Caesar, they were passing him back and forth. Neither one of them wanted anything to do with him. Well, the one good thing about Herod and Caesar was because of Jesus, they became friends. Until then, they, they really didn't like each other. So we'll give Jesus that. At least he brought these enemies together. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see of him, look, of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. He was like, show me a miracle. And what did Jesus do that whole time? He didn't say a word. He just stood there. Listen, he didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to. Listen, here's the thing we need to understand about this. Even though they were pressing Jesus, they wanted something on their term. And the only response they got is something very powerful. I'm going to break it down to you here at the end of this thing and really show you what this means. He says, no sign is going to begin. Now, he's talking to the, the religious leaders now. He said, listen, there's no sign that's going to be given to you except for the sign of Jonah. It's the sign of Jonah. What does that mean? It was an enigmatic statement. And he goes and he starts to, to say some things. Let me just jump here real quick and just say this, though. Listen, God is not a circus, a circus act who needs to perform to be proven. That's what Jesus was doing. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a sign. I'm not going to do nothing for you. The only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. I'm not going to do a miracle for you. Here's the problem with us. We want to demand God into action. A lot of people do. They, but you cannot demand that God do anything. I don't care what your situation is. You cannot demand. Listen, God's on his own time frame. He's sovereign. God does what God wants to do when he wants to do it. People don't get this. They think, well, I'm a believer and I believe the word that God owes me. That God, God doesn't owe us anything. And you know what that's a sign of? That's a sign of a bad relationship. Because when you have a relationship with God, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you trust him through everything. When the tires have fallen off, you're trusting him. When the bank account's empty, you're still trusting him. When you need food on the table, you're trusting him. And here's the secret. God will move in your situation when he needs to move in your situation. But he promised us he would. But we can't stand up there and demand, well, God, I demand this of you and I demand that of you. A.W. Tozer, we're going to hear a couple of quotes from A.W. Tozer. I don't know, this is A.W. Tozer's Sunday. I like him. I like what he has to say, but he said this. He says this, true faith rests upon the character of God and ask no further proof than the moral perfection of the one who cannot lie. In other words, it's about your relationship with him. God's character tells us that he is an ever present help, that he is there for us, not to work things out in our time, not to do our little list of whatevers, but for us to understand who he is and to grow through those times of testing, through those times of wait. How many of y'all love the wait factor? You know, God answers three ways. Yes, no, and the worst. Nah, it's not the worst. It's the best in the long run, but the one that we hate Wait, wait, I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to say no. And that's what Tozer was saying. Listen, it's all about God, he, who God is and what he said and who he is. So basically it's this, faith is the opposite of fickleness. I thought that was a pretty good word. The Pharisees were being fickle. They had no faith who Jesus was. They didn't care. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 1.9. God is what? 
Everybody say that. God is what? Faithful. Faithful. I want you to speak to your situation, whatever it is, those that are watching live. God is faithful over my situation right now. Come on. We all need this today. I need this today. You need this today. God is faithful. It may not be in our time. It may not be according to the way we think and our wisdom and the way we work. It's going to be totally a God thing. But when it's a God thing, it goes beyond anything. It is absolutely certain that God did this and that we could not have manufactured this answer, that we could not have done this within our ability. God has got to be the one doing it so that it is impossible that God does in your life. Other than that, it's possible. You can work it out yourself. But that's not how God works. And so, I love this. You're going to love this story. So here's Jesus. He's got these religious leaders. They're all doing their thing that the religious leaders did. They were trying to make his life horrible. But the red sky warning was the signs of the time. It was a warning to know the signs of the time. Jesus is rebuking them about their discernment. Now, look what he's doing. He said they could discern nature, but they couldn't discern the very scripture they had given their life to do. They couldn't see what was right there in front of their face for a lot of reasons. Pride. They hated that Jesus had crowds. They wanted the crowds. Listen, when you want the crowds more than you want Christ, more than you want God working, then you've missed it. Because that's what Phariseeism is. Oh, man, look at everybody's giving me the accolades. I got my church is growing and blowing. Man, we got all these people coming in. I said this a couple of weeks. There's not a church in America bigger than what Taylor Swift is bringing in. And she's not godly. She draws bigger crowds. Listen, we need to understand it's not about the crowds. It's not about us. It's not our attention. It's not about how great we preach this week. It's not about any of those things. It's about how high did we elevate Jesus Christ in our lives and in the lives around us. Did Jesus get exalted today in your church service? Was Jesus the center of attention today in your church service, in your life, in the things that are going on? Is Jesus Christ the very center and the ultimate, ultimate in your life today? So it was a warning. You can discern all these things. Listen, you can discern the weather, but you can't discern that the Messiah is standing right here in front of you. All the signs and prophecies pointed to Jesus to be the Messiah, and they still couldn't see it. It was right there. And here's the danger today, and here's what I'm going to bring out to the church today, because we are not discerning and seeing the signs of the times. Oh, we can discern this and we can discern that. Oh, I have a feeling that so-and-so is going to do this. I have a bad feeling about this and a bad feeling about that. But here's the thing, and it's going to make sense in a minute. Just bear with me for a second because I'm fixing to bring this thing and ring the bell. Are you all ready? I got to I gotta hurry. Here we go. So let me bring you to a verse today. This is for us today. This is for us. I know it was 2,000 years ago, but this is for us. Look at what it said, 2 Timothy 31.5. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, what does that word perilous mean? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. I'll put it up there in the Greek for you. It means this, the idea through the idea of reducing the strength. Think about it. Difficult, dangerous, and fierce times. Times that are going to cause even the strongest to lose their strength. Times that are going to challenge even the strongest believer in their faith. As, their, as the Bible is being challenged, as their faith is being challenged, because God is working in ways we don't understand. And we think that everything should be a bed of flowers, a, a bed of roses, so to speak, in, in, in our lives all the time. But listen, as the as Jesus' time to return comes nearer, it's going to get darker and darker. 
things are going to get more difficult. That's what he's saying. Things in your life are going to become dangerous to the believer because you may be tempted to give up on God. You may be tempted to compromise because you don't want to rock the boat of the world and society and be called a hater and to be called names and to go against the flow of society. Jesus never called us to go along with the flow of society. He called us to be a light in the darkness. He called us to be salt to this earth. He called us to be different than the world, but the world has been pressing and pressing more and more and more as we see it. We're seeing it more through this, this Olympic fiasco that's been going on. The devil is no longer hiding what he's doing. He's being very bold about it. And he's saying, if you don't get on board, then you are not part of society. Well, I got news for you. The Bible says, I'm a stranger. I'm an alien. I even have an alien language, Linda. I speak alien. <laughs> Come on. Somebody say amen. We don't belong here. And this is a perilous time. And we know that because we're looking at all the signs of the times. And Jesus was saying the same thing to those Pharisees as he's speaking to the church today. Can you discern the time? Look at the sky. The sky is red. And what do we do? We go on about our lives. And a lot of churches today want to be relevant and part of what's going on and they want to embrace that thing and you know we don't want to be called weird we want people to come in and listen we need to understand discernment let me just give you the rest of this verse because this is going to make sense i read this a couple weeks ago for men shall be lovers of their own selves think about it think about what's going on right now in our world they're going to be covetous boasters proud blasphemous blasphemers they're going <laughs> You can't blaspheme God any more than the Olympic opening ceremony did. My goodness. From mockery of Christianity to the writer in the book of Revelation riding down the, the river sin. What a mockery of God. Listen, if they'd have mocked Allah or the Quran, they'd have been burning that place down. I'm just telling you the truth. Listen, blasphemers, we're seeing it in America. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. I was sitting there, we were watching, I was like just, just being disgusted. I'm going to just say this. If that ceremony didn't disgust your spirit, when you're seeing men dressed as women and you're seeing three people walk into a room to have sex, something is wrong with your spirit. It's broken. It was grieving me. I was going, Lisa, something's wrong with it. I don't like this. This just doesn't feel good. I just don't like this. So this is the worst ceremony. Something that was supposed to bring unity and bring the nations together and, you know, lift up our sports figures. People who worked all their lives to get there to have this kind of stuff. Listen, it was bad. And if you didn't feel that, get your feeler checked. Get into the altar today and say, God, show me. Give me more discernment. The sky is red. The sky is red. Are we watching the warning signs? It goes on, it says, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, meaning no self-control. Yeah. Fierce despisers of those that are good. Do you know how many people were almost banned from their competition because they had the face of Christ on a surfboard? or they said something about God, or they quoted a verse. There was a lot of Christians in the Olympics from many nations. I don't know if y'all saw that. Listen, CNN's not going to show you that. The news is not going to show you that. But there are Christians that were in the Olympics that were told, no, you got to take Christ off your surfboard or you're disqualified. Listen, if that doesn't get your blood boiling about what's going on, then you need to get something fixed there. I don't want to fit into that. Fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, meaning rash, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, have any form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And that last part is so scary because that's about the church. You're looking at the church that's supposed to have this power of God and they're denying the power to accept the world so that they can keep the numbers, so that they can keep the money coming in, so that they can keep their big buildings. God 
help us in this country. The, the sky is red. And when I was out there that morning and I was watching that sun come up and I saw that red sky, this really grabbed my heart. Uh, when we went to Bryce, Bryce Canyon, I'm going to talk more about Bryce Canyon. It was amazing. Bryce Canyon was the best. But it was dawn, just a few people around us. And Alyssa got out her Bible and she started reading scriptures. Well, I get, I get chills thinking as the sun was coming up. And it was so, so amazing. I kept thinking about that sermon I preached a while back about David said, I will wake the morning with my praise. That's what we were doing. It was amazing. Woo, let me get on. I can get into that. Let me just show you some things here. So uh, here's another A.W. Tozer. It's A.W. Tozer Day. It says, we have learned to live with unholiness and have to come. Let me back up. And I just messed that one up. We have learned to live without unholiness and have to have come to look upon it as a natural and expected thing. Oh, this is just normal. This is okay. So what? That person's a cross-dresser. So the pers person changed their sex. Let me tell you the problem with changing your sex. It's demonic. It's a spit in God's face saying that God didn't create me the way I needed to be created. I'm going to tell you something. And once again, I was talking to Pastor Mark. Uh, I was talking about his in the news, which was amazing this past week. And uh, I said, Pastor Mark, I saw a, a woman, and she was a woman, you could tell, with a full bore man's beard. I said, it gritted my spirit. I couldn't even look at it. It made me sick. And that's what it should. It shouldn't be, oh, we need to embrace you. I'm going to love you because you, you got to find yourself. Listen, that is so wrong. There's something wrong with that. It's demonic from the pit of hell. I'm just telling you, it is bad. But we have learned to live with ungodliness and have come to look upon it as natural and an expected thing. It's time for the church. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus didn't die for these people. He died for them. It doesn't mean we should not love them through the word of God to get them saved. But it doesn't mean that we need to jump on their bandwagon and go, oh, this is an okay thing. God's good with this. So I mean, this week it said that Jesus sat with sinners, but not to become like them, but to save them. And that's the truth of what's going on. So let me go on real quick. We've seen these verses. Come on, phone. Work with me. Isaiah 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that called evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We've been seeing that one all over social media. Here's another one. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap upon themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Real quick, let me show you what's going on in, in this verse. What in the world is the sign of Jonah? Said, I'm not going to do anything for you. I'm not going to do a miracle. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah. Now, who is Jonah? Jonah, and we're going to look at this later, was a shadow and type of Christ. And this verse is going to make it all make sense. Look at this real quick. Matthew 12, 39, 41. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Why? He goes on. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall be the Son of Man three days and nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, he adds a clincher here. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and condemn you because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, one greater than Jonas is here. So this is what it's about. This is what he's saying. The four R's of the sign of Jonas. He's talking about the resurrection. Jonas was resurrected. Jesus was resurrected. He's talking about to the Pharisees, I'm going to be, and the Sadducees, the sign of Jonah is this, I am the Messiah. I'm going to die and I'm going to be resurrected. Now, y'all know that's going to mess the, the Sadducees up. They, they couldn't handle it. So he's, he's speaking in an enigma. It was right there in front of their face, just like it is today. Jesus is saying, this is everything right now. 
The sign of Jonah, the sign of the red sky is about this. It's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ who conquered death, hell, and the grave with His blood. And He's been resurrected and He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He is who He said He is. He is who the Word of God says He is. He can do what He said He can do, which brings us to the next part. It's about repentance. The, the religious leaders did not want to repent. They thought they had it all together. So He's throwing this at them. He says, I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to die and be resurrected. And you're going to have to repent of your sins. It's not about your religion. It's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And until we get this in the church, until we understand it's not about religion, but it's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. Is he your Lord and Savior? Has he changed your life? Have you allowed him to change your life? Are you walking in a newness, in a new spirit that he gave you? It's about regeneration. It's about changing an old dead man and resurrecting him to a life. Come on, I've been born again. I've been raised. We sang the song, Rise Up, Lazarus. We have come out of the grave of death. We are alive today because of Jesus Christ. We're alive today because of the Holy Spirit. The sign of Jonah today needs to be preached from every pulpit. Listen, it's about the resurrection of Christ. It's about repenting. It's about being regenerated. And it's about this last night. Thing. It's about the return of Jesus Christ because he's coming back. Listen, the Bible says when you see these things, when you see all these evil things coming upon this world, this is what you need to do. And Luke, it says, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. It means that Jesus Christ is about to come and take the church out. The ones that really love him, the ones that are living for him, the ones that are looking for him. These are the ones that are going to be taken out and then God's going to allow evil to burn itself out before Jesus comes and establishes his throne on this planet in the city of Jerusalem. And he will rule and reign there for a thousand years. Listen, there's a power coming that this world knows nothing of. That the world and politics tries to steal and lord over people. It, their powers, a different power, it's control and money for them. They could care less about you. But when Jesus comes, it's going to be different. It's about real power and real authority. It's about a real king and not some puppet elected whatever is out there today. Y'all understand this? The red sky warning. This is what it's about. Are you seeing the red sky? Are you looking up? And as I was uh, preparing this, I, I, I didn't put this verse in, but it says Jesus is going to come from the where? When he comes in the rapture, he's coming from the east. Somebody said it, from the east. From the east. And I'm going to show you this picture again. Look at that. That's the east. The sun is rising in the east with a sign. Jesus is going to fulfill this sign as he returns from the east. If you get into the story of Jonah, he was going west. But God wanted him to go where? East. From the east. Come on. The Bible says, that he, remo he removes our sins as far as the what? East. Because you can keep going east and you can keep going east forever. He doesn't say north and south because eventually you go south from north or north from south. East to the, listen, there's more to what's going on. It's a sign of You need to understand we're in a time that can be dangerous. If you're a believer that's living on the edge, I preached this last week testing the, the limits. How close to the world can you live and still feel like you're saved? That's, that's not what it's about. What it's about is getting the world out of us and get more of Christ in us. So I want to pray for you today. Wow, what a powerful, powerful word. But I want to pray for those uh, that are watching today and, and those that are in the house. Father, I pray right now. Father God, that the word would go out and enlighten us. God, that the word would grab our spirit today and the spirit would just take us and begin to 
Get us to discern the hour that we're in and the urgency of this hour. God, that we can proclaim the name of Jesus wherever we go. God, that, that we're in the midnight hour. It's just this close for you to return. So, Lord, I pray for everybody that's watched, God, that this would stir them in the decision, God, to understand that they need a Savior and they need to call on Jesus Christ and apply that blood over their lives and the blood over, uh, over their sins today. And, God, we give you all the praise and the glory and honor in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, thank you for watching us today. I pray that this message touched you and that you share it. Um, this, seem, this series seems to be uh, getting out there. It's, it's growing, and every week I look at it, more people are watching. And that's good. That means people are getting interested about Jesus' return and living for him. So I just pray that that is your prayer. So join us again next week. Until then, keep on keeping on for the Lord. Thank you.